Hello again and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. I'll be your host for the next hour of answering your gardening questions. You can get in touch with us by dialing 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 1-800-676-5446. If you'd like to send us your question or picture by email, that address is byf at unl.edu. We do answer those on a future show. Attach them as JPEGs, and please give us as much information as you can, including where you live. We're not stalkers. And remember, you can follow Backyard Farmer during the week on our social media stuff. That includes Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So Jody, you have one living well boxed and you have many yes. that are dead. So we've been getting some calls in the metro area about hornets that are attacking and dive bombing people around their houses. And what we have here, I've got a live cicada killer wasp here, and then I have a couple samples here. Um, I've got a female on this side and a male on this side, and uh, you can see that the female is a lot larger and she does have a stinger but she rarely uses it. She uses it to um, subdue cicadas that are singing in the trees and she creates a burrow and put, drags those down and then will lay eggs on them and then they overwinter that way. Um, the bottom um, specimen you can see I've got a cicada killer female with a cicada so um, I went out to grab some samples and this is what I have. I just want to tell people that they are scary but they are quite harmless. Um, I've been telling people to hit them out of the air with a tennis racket or you can catch it with a net and freeze them. Um, you can call a professional company that may want to come and treat, but um, it is very difficult. They do love the full sun, well-drained soil, and they love being up against landscaping or under any kind of vegetation. So it is very difficult to control, but it's good to know that they won't hurt you. And the ones that are flying in your face, those are the males, and they do not have any venom and they don't sting. So. You know something that they don't know. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jody. All right, Matt, some, some things that we don't want in our yard, right? Yes, they're just as dangerous as the cicada killers. <laughs> they're, they're taking over people's lawns and they, they don't know what to do with them. Uh, so what I have here is I have goosegrass. Um, and the reason it's, it's called goosegrass, as you can see on the top here, it has seed heads and they kind of resemble a goose's foot. And they're uh, kind of that web design and usually in groups of three, although this one's got four, but uh, it, that's where it got its name is because of the, the seed head that it makes. And the common uh, mistake that someone might make if they find this in their lawn, I have a couple smaller ones here. Um, they look just like crabgrass when they're young for the most part. Uh, so I have crabgrass here on my right and goosegrass here on the left. and. The difference is that goosegrass has uh, a folded or folded uh, folded leaves, and then the crabgrass has a rolled leaf. Uh, so if you look at them closely, you can see that uh, this one's really flat, and they actually grow really low and flat to the ground, and usually have kind of a white center. This one's not very white, but they get pretty white when they get bigger. And the crabgrass will generally not have that, and the leaves are somewhat fuzzy on the top and the bottom, whereas goosegrass is not. So if you have goosegrass, uh, most crabgrass herbicides do not work on it. So if you're spraying it, trying to kill it, it's not going to die. There's, there's basically one product that works really well, and that's Pilex or Topramazone. And that's pretty much the only one that works uh, in controlling goosegrass really well. So if you have it and you have small amounts of it, I'd say pull it out because it makes a lot of seed, and you don't want it taking over your lawn, especially in the thinned areas. That's usually where we find it mostly. Interesting that it could change its character so much when it grows up. Oh, yeah. It's... Yeah. It's an amazing weed, and it takes over quite fast. <laughs> All right, Amy, rots and spots. Rots and spots taking over my pepper plants once again. So we're starting to get some questions on peppers, on things that are occurring. And what I brought today is bacterial spot on pepper. It's called, it's by a bacterium called Xanthomonas. So if we take a look here, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at this leaf right here, you can see this dark green discoloration right by my finger there. This is called water soaking. This is what we refer to when bacterial diseases start. This is a darker green coloration, but then give it a day or two, and then it's going to start looking like these other spots, dark brown, kind of flaky in the middle, and then this really big yellow halo. And so you can see on my leaves here, I got several different stages <clears throat> of bacterial spot. The trick with this one is, um, 
This is a disease that is really transmitted 100% by seed. And mm. so the seeds of the pepper will carry the bacteria. You grow the pepper and it looks fine and happy. It delays its symptom um, showing until the temperatures get up in the upper 80s to early 90s. And then all of a sudden, bang, are you're seeing all these brown spots on your leaves. And if it's severe enough, you can get full defoliation of your peppers and you won't get any produce. It can also move to the fruit itself and cause sunken in lesions and brown spots all over your peppers too. But this is a tough one because you, you look at your plants in the greenhouse before you purchase them, you think you're good to go, and then it warms up and then all of a sudden it shows up. Or you buy good quality seed and you think you're good and they, your seed provider didn't realize it was infected either. So. Um, this does go to tomatoes, so one of the best thing to do is pinch off leaves as you see it. Otherwise, if you have a row of peppers, remove the plant that's closest to the next plant that isn't showing symptoms because this will move by rain, splashing back and forth the bacteria from plant to plant. That way, only a few of your row is affected versus the whole thing, and rotate your plants in your garden every single year. Okay, it just sounds not fair. No, it is not. <laughs> All right, John, you have a way cool native tree for your sample. Uh, I do. So sometimes inspiration just happens upon you. So I just showed up on campus and was like, what will I, will I show? And I was in front of Ag Hall today, and there was a patch of pawpaw trees. So there are some in the landscaping there. And so uh, we have this, this lovely uh, tree with a nice edible fruit. Uh, it's a great ornamental plant for your landscape. Uh, it's a, a nice compact tree, maybe about 20 to 25 feet tall. Um, it is a native fruit. Uh, the name actually comes probably from a derivation of papaya. Early explorers thought it resembled papaya. Uh, and so that is sort of where the, the name probably comes from. Uh, and you know, it's inspired lots of people. Uh, you sing about it, you know, way down yonder in the pawpaw patch. Uh, and uh, it has an interesting banana-like tropical fruit flavor. It's very custardy, but it has lots of seeds. So you have to be very dedicated if you want to eat the pawpaw. Uh, and it's a, a neat plant. Uh, you have to have two for cross-pollination. Uh, and they have interesting pollinators. They are fly pollinated. Uh, so the flowers are dark brown and they don't smell pleasant. And so after uh, you get that pollination, you get these wonderful fruit, but you have smelly, ugly kind of flowers. And then it tastes that. like a banana, which is absolutely not my favorite fruit. Right, it tastes like a banana custardy kind of, and it, they get like, they almost have to be like almost totally rotten to eat. Like this is way not ready to eat. Like they are almost black. <laughs> right. Uh-huh, you'd have to really be hungry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Jody, this is our actually our very first picture of this little nasty beastie. This is from Alma, Nebraska. We had two or three after this one came in. I think our viewers can probably see them running around on the pumpkins. Mm -hmm. The question is, did they and do they cause damage and what is that damage? They most certainly do cause damage. So, these are squash bugs. And they may look really cute, and I love bugs, but these are not good bugs. So you're going to want to check all your plants that are in the cu cucurbit family, right? Mm -hmm. So squash and the pumpkins and zucchini. And you pick them off. If you see these orange little football-type eggs, you want to scrape those off. And um, some people can vacuum uh, the squash bugs off, but you're going to want to get those off because they will um, feed the sap from the stems and the leaves, things will turn brown, it will look really bad. So um, you can use uh, treatment, you can do bifenthrin or carbaryl um, or per permethrin to, to do some treatment on that. You wanna make sure it's uh, thoroughly covered on the leaves and the undersides as well. All right, and they are nasty. Yeah, they're, they're gonna be bad, yeah. Okay, all right, so Matt, this is actually a follow-up question. Um, we looked at this lawn from this person in Elkhorn two or three weeks ago and thought maybe it was heat stress, environmental yeah. sorts of issues, and it's <clears throat> just getting worse and worse and worse. And he is willing to send us a sample, but yeah, you know, we want to look at the pictures again and say, what do, what do we think here? I mean, there's, yeah, the sample would be great so you can rule out if it is a disease or if it's something else. Um, just looking at the picture where you're, you're kind of seeing that mottled look, and it looks like it's tall fescue. Uh, there could be 
uh, you know, issues with drought stress, which caused some of that, but maybe there's an underlying factor, maybe some grubs in there, because it looks like they're small pockets, um, and it's kind of growing into, I mean, a regular shape or big, large circle. So that would be another question. If you do have grubs, you could check by pulling the turf up, and if there's no root system, uh, that'd be a great way to, you know, rule that out if, if, if it is grubs or not. Um, and then, obviously, we've had some really high, high heat, humidity. Um, it could have just been that the turf died down. It might come back, and if not, then you're probably going to have to overseed that because tall fescue will not spread and, and fill those spots in. So please send in a sample so we can, you know, check and see if it's something other than what I'm talking about. All right, perfect. Thanks, Matt. Okay, Amy, um, this is a viewer who has uh, clematis or clematis, depending on where you're from. She's, she, she says it's looking pretty gnarly, and it is, and she's, she's wondering how you tell if it has wilt or a different fungal disease. How does she treat it if it's got wilt and with what? If it's a fungal thing, how does she treat it and with what? Okay. <laughs> so in general, clematis are fairly disease resistant. They do develop a leaf spot, and you can see on this picture there's some brown spots. One thing you can do, and I couldn't tell from the picture, is the leaf spot that it does develop will develop coincentric rings. So it'll look like, like a tree trunk. So those rings inside, and those are the sporulation that is occurring. But the leaf spot isn't going to give you that yellowing that you're seeing so pronounced throughout that entire clematis mm -hmm. canopy. So depending on where you're at, and the viewer didn't tell us where they were from, if I remember right. right. Depending on where you're at in the state, for me, up in northern, north central Nebraska, we've been extremely wet. With the clematis being that yellow, I would start wondering if it isn't a little too wet. So check its feet, see if it's extremely wet or not. If you're in the eastern part of the state where you've been a little bit drier, well, then I might want to start looking at a nutritional issue. Maybe it's lacking a little bit of nitrogen or something like that. Um, the brown spots at this point in time, check to see if there's coincentric rings. If there is, you can treat with a copper product. But my gut instinct is saying it's probably not that. I wouldn't recommend the treatment. Look at those roots and take an assessment and maybe give it some fertilizer from there. All right. Thanks, Amy. All right. So, John, this is horticultural to begin with, and then it becomes right. insectal and rotty and spotty and no turf involved but yeah we don't want any turf <laughs> we've we've <Sarah>. had <laughs> right <laughs> we've had this before and now we're really getting more and more of it and you've got three pictures that are peach so this right. one's a little hard to see but she described it as gooey and then the second one um, is a six-year-old peach tree great peach crop last year no issues this year they all have clear goo weird darkening leaves look good and then he sent us a couple of what's inside them when you open them up mm -hmm. to enjoy the peach pie with the protein. Yes. So with peaches, one thing that happens on any injury that it will get on the fruit and actually the tree uh, mm -hmm. itself is called what's called gamosis. So basically if you think about that lovely uh, you know, the, the peach juice that if you bite into a juicy peach, this is sort of the concentrated form that comes out if the peach is injured. So it could be from an insect injury, which this time of year, you know, you could get Japanese beetles taking a little bite. Mm -hmm. uh, you could uh, have bird injury uh, from a bird that comes along and pecks it. You could have other uh, bugs, any disease that makes any kind of spot on that peach could open it up to that gummosis. So it's really hard to say you know exactly what is causing that uh, but we do have you know some insects that can get in there um, one that actually gets inside of peaches and can be a little surprised when you open it up is an earwig uh, and it's kind of creepy when it crawls out uh, you know I've started slicing open a peach and an earwig like jumps out at me uh, and they're a little frightening looking uh, you know I know, Jody, you love bugs. Not everyone loves bugs. So you eat them with your eyes closed, right? Yeah. Right, yes. So eat the peach with your eyes closed, bake it into a pie, you can't tell. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really hard to tell what that, that problem would be. Any, any problem will cause that gummosis. All right, and that is exactly why I don't eat fried peaches at the fair, just in case. There's... It's That's what they do with all those bug-infested ones, right? <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you 
<laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> well, you know, part of keeping your lawn looking neat and trim is regular mowing. For our first feature tonight, we turn to our turf grass specialist, Bill Kreuzer, for tips on mowing height and frequency. We hear all the time on the show, mow to the one-third rule. What does that mean? Where did that come from? Well, this is a research plot that we have here on our turf plots on East Campus, where we're trying to evaluate how often and how high you should mow your lawn. So we have a plot here with, with tall fescue and we have some buffalo grass next nearby. We're trying to determine what's the optimum mowing frequency and mowing height for tall fescue and for buffalo grass. And I mean optimum of I'm not scalping, it makes the grass healthy, minimum lots of weeds, but also to, to have the slowest amount of growth. The more growth we get, the faster it grows, the faster the nutrients are taken up, the faster it burns sugar. So in this study, we're evaluating different mowing frequencies. And those frequencies are based on how fast the grass is growing. So the one third rule would mean we'd mow as soon as the grass uh, was tall enough that we would remove one third of the clippings at mowing. So if we're mowing at three inches, we measure and when the grass hits four and a half inches, then we mow. We have different thresholds too, like we mow once a week or once every uh, quarter rule. So we're removing a quarter of the leaf whenever we're doing our mowing application. We also have one that's kind of scalping and that's mowing half of the leaf off. So if we have a three inch plot, we let it grow to six inches and we cut it off. Then we also have monthly and uh, twice a year and once a year mowing to look at what the total amount of growth rate would be. So what are we finding? We're finding that the one-third rule actually is the best recommendation for mowing frequency. If you're mowing lower at two inches, we don't recommend that generally because it means you have to mow more than once a week and people don't want to do that. So if you mow at three inches, you can at least be mowing once a week or sometimes even once every 10 days to two weeks depending on how fast that grass is growing. If we scalp and we're actually removing more than one-third of the leaf at one time, then the grass actually grows faster. So it's kind of counterintuitive. We're trying to uh, slow that growth rate down, we're scalping it, and then the grass is growing even greater rate. The other problem with scalping is, well, it looks terrible. Nobody wants a bad looking lawn. And we get weeds like crabgrass start to come in, especially in the summertime. So we don't want to do that. So it's a pretty interesting type of a research project. The one third rules existed for such a long time, and it's nice to actually put numbers to it and evaluate it in a scientific way and say, yes, mowing to the one third rule works. Um, if you want to mow lower, say, you know, I don't want a three inch lawn, just know that you're going to have to probably mow more than once a week in the middle of the summer or this early spring when we get that big growth surge to keep up with the one third rule. Mowing is one of the best things that we can do for controlling the, uh, weeds and maintaining a, a dense lawn. If you look at those athletic fields on TV, they're mowed a couple times a week and they look fantastic. Use this cultural practice to promote a nice, healthy, vigorous turf grass and, uh, and, and have the best looking lawn in the neighborhood. So set it to three inches, forget it, try not to remove more than a third of the blade of grass at a single time and that's pretty simple except for when it rains and it like you've mowed and the next day you got to mow and the next day you've got to mow. Or if you're pounding it with fertilizer. Well, there you go. Stay lean. Stay lean. <laughs> lean and clean. All right, Jody, you have a series of like five, six, seven insect pictures, but these are all oak. Okay. And so, you know, we've been getting so many questions and pictures of oak and what's wrong with it. This is a young swamp white oak that has the off-color checker pattern. He sent us a picture on the back of an insect. And then I think beyond that one, you've got an oak from Ithaca that is another one. And then you've got one that's got brown spots and shrivelly. And then you've got another one that's completely So oaks are looking left. pretty bad. Oaks are looking pretty okay, bad. Okay, so one of the pictures there, I could see some, some little beasties on there. Right. And those are oak sawflies. Mm -hmm. And so this is an immature moth, or no, actually an immature wasp. So this is not a caterpillar because it won't turn into a... Uh, or no, it's a butterfly. It won't turn into a butterfly. Right. Right. It turns into a wasp. And they're called like sawflies and slug sawflies because they are like slimy and greasy looking, but they all really do feed together in this one motion. So that's what they are. They will skeletonize the underside of the leaf and kind of leave this paper thin epidermis layer, kind of like this little window. 
Um, and some of the other pictures look like it's likely the same thing. Um, there is one, uh, one picture with a, with a larger damage, and that could be an oak leaf skeletonizer, which is mm -hmm. um, a lepidopter, and so it is a moth. And so the reason why there's a difference there is because some people like to use BT when it comes to um, caterpillars, but BT will not work against sawflies, so that's important. If you want to know for sure if it's a, a caterpillar, if they're still feeding, you will see frass, um, so fecal pellets um, captured in silk. So that is one way to tell, but they could um, also be the sawfly. A lot of times in the oaks, there isn't, um, it isn't necessary to do a treatment though. You can um, prune off um, what's affected. Um, and I mean, treatment, if they're not small, little larval sawflies, then it's not gonna do any good anyway. Okay. So hopefully that answers the question. Well, and again, we're, we're getting so many questions. We're actually going to have a segment next week on this that, that really goes through it all. But it's mostly, you know, what happened to my oak, and no, don't, don't spray it with something. Right. Yeah, right. all right. Good. Okay, so kind of the central part of the state, because most of those were actually east, uh, Jody. This is Ewing, Nebraska. And this viewer is wondering if this is crabgrass. And then, of course, the follow-up is if it's not, what is it and what to do about it? Yeah, this one, I actually had to ask a couple people, and I still don't know what it is. It's not crabgrass. Right. And I cannot find anything that it resembles. Um, if, if you have a sample that you could send in, or if there's somebody around here that has a sample, it looks like some type of grass because it's got nodes and inner nodes, mm -hmm. but the fruit that's in the middle or the seed, it's like kind of a round ball a bead yes a bead mm -hmm. and i i have no idea what it is and there so is there I'll is an ornamental look. grass that has a bead seed okay so it. it probably is some so. sort of ornamental then right do you know flew right, right in never mind flew right out but i know where to <laughs> but i know where to find it there's a, there's a, there's one called like blue eyed grass no no but it's not that no. i always say come on up and see me bring me the sample and i'll yeah. get it down to man that would know that would help i know get exactly it. where it is i'll bring it in all right let's figure it out <laughs> <laughs> all right amy so you have uh this is also a bellevue question okay. and this one your first one here is these cukes and we've got cukes that are showing this, and then we've had two or three other people that are showing cukes. And, and in this case, he said the problem started about two weeks ago. If he keeps removing damaged leaves, it's going to completely collapse. And we have okay. another one from Hastings that's got spots, and we have a lot of them saying my cucumbers are collapsing. Okay. There's actually a combination, most likely two things going on. On the first picture, you can see that there's little white spots, kind of angular shaped on those lower leaves. This is actually a fungal disease called scab. Um, it likes water, and so it'll keep moving up the plant or across the plant with water uh, splashing with it. So it's gonna continue to progress all season long. So I would, I would maybe treat with a copper type product. Uh, be careful with copper products when you're treating, however, because if it's too warm, coppers can actually burn your foliage a little bit. Um, I usually go with the coppers just because then you don't have to worry about pre-harvest intervals nearly as much. But there are some other products on the market you could potentially look at. Now, if your whole cucumber vine is collapsing very quickly and it has sufficient water, I would probably be leaning toward bacterial wilt, mm -hmm. which is a bacterial disease that is transmitted by the striped cucumber beetle. And so it puts the bacteria in there and then it just plugs up all the vascular tissue and so pretty much the drinking straw is plugged and can't move any water and nutrient in that plant. Now, if it's collapsing that quickly, best thing to do is remove that plant because the beetles are able to smell it. It's like candy to them. So they're gonna continue feeding on those cucumbers and then they'll move on to your healthy cucumbers and just keep moving it from plant to plant to plant before you have no cucumbers left. With that in mind, when you remove it, do not put it in your compost because the beetles will go to your compost pile and feed and come back to your garden. You're gonna pull it out, throw it in the trash and get rid of it. Beyond that, there isn't a lot you can do for bacterial wilt. The other thing you can do if you really wanna know is cut the stem, put it in a clear glass of water, only about that much water in there. If the water turns cloudy or milky, it's most likely the bacterial wilt. There is one variety of cucumber that I know of, County Fair, that is resistant to bacterial wilt, but you could always look at other catalogs. All right, thanks, Amy. All right, John, so this is green beans mm. with issues that may or may not belong with somebody else, but 
Her frustration with this one is the beans themselves look great, but the foliage was kind of this wrinkly stuff, nothing's been sprayed, and, and then all of a sudden the leaves are turning yellowish and falling off. She is from Cambridge. She does rotate her crop, so they've not been planted in the same spot for years and years. Any ideas on this one? Well, that's good. So with most of the diseases that we see with beans and things like that, you're gonna have more discrete spots, smaller <coughs> spots. Um, and if you had a nutritional deficiency, that's gonna be more like the bottom leaves turning yellow and falling off. So I'm leaning actually toward environmental factors. I'm thinking some drought stress, mm -hmm. um, maybe even a little sun scald, a little drought going on, and it's just affecting those few certain leaves. I don't think that there's, because we're not seeing stuff on the beans, and usually right. if it's a disease, it'll also go to the bean as well, and you'll see spots like anthracnose, little specks and things like that, and I'm not seeing that. So I think it's just environmental. All right, and eat the beans. Just eat the beans. All right, <laughs> thanks, John. <clears throat> well, everything out at our garden is really starting to come into the bloom this week, and we're going to look at a special flower. Let's take a minute to hear from Terry James about what's happening this week in the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, again, we're continuing with our All-America Selection winners. We have some really great ones for 2018. We have a new zinnia. It's called Queenie Lime Orange. Want kind of one of those funky colors in your garden? This is definitely one that you can put in there and show off. It's actually pretty tall. It's been blooming. We've been seeing um, quite a little bit of pollinator process on it, so that's been really nice. It will take full sun. Normal, it almost takes some drought conditions. We do recommend that you deadhead it to keep it blooming throughout the season. It gets to be about a foot and a half to two foot tall. Um, it will bloom all summer long into frost, take just a slight bit of frost at the beginning of the year. But the colors are what's really cool about this. And it's kind of a lime, yellow, orange, pink salmon. So it'll be a really good one that you can kind of use as a filler in some, with some of those other colors in your containers. So check out the Xenia Queenie Lime Orange in the Backyard Farmer Garden this week. You know, those new zinnias are really gorgeous. They're easy to grow. They're comfortable in a leading role in the garden or perhaps support. And they're great for cutting. I bring them in. All right, Jody, time for a quick question. Um, this is a viewer who has burning bush, west side of the house. They've lost about 50% of their foliage. Wondering, is it heat or are we seeing spider mites in euonymus and burning bushes right now? Um, it does sound like spider mites. They come out when it's pretty hot. Um, there might have been scale, but it's probably not the time to treat for that. You'd want to do that when the crawlers are out. So if you're going to treat for the spider mites, then I would do that. Okay, tap a piece of paper and watch for them, yeah. right? Okay, good. All right, uh, Matt, this is from McCook, and this buffalo grass lawn apparently has chickweed. When does he treat for it, and with what? Hmm, <laughs> chickweed. Hmm. I'm thinking you would want to treat for it early on before it's seeding out, so anytime now, because it's going to be soon ending its life with all uh, the seed dropping on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't want to really go with any 2,4-D products because they're not, uh, this time of year with the heat, they're going to burn the buffalo grass also. So there's some products that have triclopyr or clopyrrolid in them, and those are a lot safer in higher temperatures. So I would go with some of those products. And still wait till we get good temps. Yes, yeah. it looks like this next week's gonna be cooling off a little a bit. A good week. Yep, All good right. week to treat. Thanks, Matt. All right, Amy, uh, we have people that are saying on their, on their hydrangeas that are actually the panicle type, so fully woody, limelight, and those guys, they're seeing a bunch of rust. Are you, is there anything you can do for rusty leaves on hydrangea, or do you just look a different direction? A lot of times with hydrangeas, I'll look the other way, but if you're actually able to rub your fingers across it and they're coming back reddish or orange in coloration, you're probably dealing with a rust. Um, avoid overhead irrigation if you can avoid it. And if it continues to progress, you can come back in with several of the fungicides that are on the market. You can come in with a copper product, a chlorothalonil, um, a man or something like that to treat it if it's really moving up the plant and you're really concerned. 
if it's staying on those lower leaves, look the other way and you'll find something else pretty to look at. All right, thanks, Amy. All right, John, uh, Omaha viewer has fall gold raspberries next to red, red raspberries, third year. Got gold berries second year. This year the fruit is dinky, tiny, inedible. The birds won't eat it. Does he or she not have fall gold anymore and a bird brought them something else perhaps? Could have been something else. They could have been grafted plants and the, the scion on the top has died and something else has come back that, you know, had whatever characteristic they were trying to, to give it, but it doesn't have good fruit. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, I would check it out next year, see what's going on, and, and if it's still dinky, I would uh, prune it at the ground level or dig it out. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I'm going to win it this time, maybe. Okay, depending on the <laughs> Depending questions. on these people. Okay, yeah. so we have a, from Omaha, a Japanese maple with an unpronounceable name that was damaged with a weed trimmer by a lawn company. They're wondering whether she should wrap it or paint it or do something to help it seal. Do not. Just let it oh, uh, heal from the, from the air. It's sort of like putting a bandage on it and it'll stay wet and that can introduce diseases. So let it heal without covering. Perfect. We have a Lincoln viewer who uh, has butternut squash that has been picked already. Will it ripen if it is left in a cool spot? It is not. Butternut squash is a non-climacteric fruit, meaning that it does not ripen after picking. Perfect. Do we recommend putting anything like weed berry or plastic under mulch in the gardens? Absolutely not. That is not recommended anymore. Perfect. We have a hydrangea that has trunk chew on it. Is that something to be wrapped or treated or same deal? Same deal. I let things heal on their own. Uh, wrapping them up can make a wet spot that will allow diseases in. Okay, we have a giant coleus in a pot with some other things. It has taken over everything else. What can be done? You just have to prune it back so it, it will grow, so prune it. All right, in Blair, the cones are heavy on the branches of a Norway spruce. Pick them off or let it be. So leave them in place. They will finally dry up and they will lighten and it will sort of spring back into place. And unlike Elizabeth next last week, I'm going to count that one. Okay. <laughs> Good. Thank you. I All right. Say, Keep that, that in mind. Really high. Nine. Oh. <laughs> I don't think I've ever answered six. All right. Are you ready, Amy? Yeah. Sure. All right. Are there any diseases that you know of that would cause the joints of leaves on tomatoes to get swollen and hard? There's no diseases that will come to mind. Usually it's environmental. Water is one of the big issues. Okay. We have something that looks like rust on oak leaves up in the Norfolk area. Have you heard of rusts on oak? We don't have rust on oaks, but if you're seeing some browning and concern, I would take it into the extension office to make sure it is an oak blight. Okay. This person wants to know whether if they have plants that do have blight, tomato plants, can they eat the tomatoes? You can eat all the tomatoes you want off of tomato blighted plants. All right. Have fun. Um, so if we're seeing dead tops in spruce with white stuff running down the trunk, what is it, what to do? Most likely I'm going to lean toward a cytospora canker. There is nothing you can do at that point in time. Depending on the height, if it's short enough and there's a potential second leader there, train that new leader to go. If it's 30 feet tall, the top of the tree is dead. All right. Um, this viewer says there's white fluffy stuff in the mulch when a weed is pulled. Will that hurt the perennials? It shouldn't hurt the perennials. It's just a fungus breaking down that woody mulch, nice. um, giving you more carbon and nitrogen for your plants to grow. Perfect. Thank you very much. You ready, Matt? Yeah. I'm going to get seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you're not. <laughs> Okay, this is actually an O'Neill viewer who says, should I aerate this fall if I haven't done it for five years? Yes. Okay. It'll always help. When should yellow wood sorrel be controlled and how? Oh, that one can be tough. Early, early on in its life, which is really early in the spring, if you use a pre-emergent uh, for broadleaves or any type of pre-emergent early on will help. Otherwise, a lot of the three and four-way products work when it's young. All right. Is high quality seed going to be available in the fall at standard stores or should it have been purchased in the spring? No, it's, it'll still be high quality seed. All right. Uh, we actually had somebody ask, what kind of hair gel do you use? Oh, <laughs> probably, probably the best because my wife's a hairstylist, so I think it's like 
something of 10. If he's a 10. And it's look a 10. at him blush. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Can tenacity be used on four to five week old seedlings in a buffalo grass when the weeds are very prominent? Yes, it'll still be safe. All right. And does fertilizer with slow release on the label say how slow? Uh, generally, it says how much the percentage is of how much is slow release. So it'd be like 20, 10, or 30 percent. And it would be on the label. Yeah, usually it's on the label. All right, nice wow. job, wow. especially with the one in there. Again. <laughs> and that was really yeah, a question. Yeah, that should be like a double question there. That was Two really points. a question. Just so you know, I didn't make mm -hmm. that one up. Okay, all right. Are you ready, Jody? <laughs> Whatever. I guess. <laughs> all right. Uh, do adult praying mantises change their color so they can camouflage themselves? Yeah, they can, and there are different color different types of mantids and different colors and their eyes will change color in daytime and nighttime. Interesting, all right. So a Council Bluff viewer says they have an orchard with various fruits and they're all covered with some sort of a sticky substance. Could be aphid honeydew secretions. And, and what is anything they do about that on the fruit? Um, I would well, spray off the, uh, the aphids with a hard stream of water, I don't know. Okay, that's that's sugar a good will answer. attract other insects, so you want to do that. All right. So Japanese beetles, is it still okay to use neem oil on them as it was last week? Or are we out of the window? Um, you can still use them. You'll have to do regular treatments, though. Okay. This is a Snyder viewer who wants to know how you can prevent the worms in sweet corn. Um, it's probably too late now because you're eating the corn. Okay, so do the Japanese beetle traps that are sold in no bad. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and why are we not hearing very many cicadas? Maybe there's, I don't know, I hear them all the time. You know what, I do too, but maybe those cicada killer wasps that you brought in are in this particular community getting them. Maybe, maybe all right. they're trying to stay silent. <laughs> there you go. All right, John, plant of the week comes up for you. Oh, that is correct. I was having so much fun I forgot all about it. There we go. Uh, so we have uh, this week, our, our main plant of the week is uh, a native plant called cup plant. Uh, and we see the flower here and you might say, well, how is that a cup? That is not a cup. But the cup is actually this right here. Uh, and you can see the leaves sort of come together uh, in a cup-like uh, shape. And the name comes from Native Americans using it as a drinking vessel. So Kim told me I had to demonstrate, right? Right here, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> you really are gonna do it. Mm, tastes like uh, bugs that are in there. <laughs> um, so it's a great plant uh, for your garden, full sun to uh, part shade, uh, and uh, can take a, a, a moist area. Uh, we also have uh, liatris here, our gay feather. So that's this spiky one here. And this one is interesting because the flowers open and mature from the top down. Most flowers that are this spiky one go from the bottom up. Uh, so, and it's a great pollinator plant. Uh, lots of bugs uh, love it uh, with that color. The purplish, bluish color is a favorite among many different pollinators. Uh, and then we have uh, Herrenhausen oregano, which is not an edible oregano, but it's an ornamental oregano. Uh, so it has these tough, wiry stems, uh, great for, for curbside, for uh, planting uh, along the street if you're along your sidewalk. Uh, also, the great color for pollinators. So there we have all the plants of the week. Excellent. And you did a really nice job of drinking out of that cup without spilling it all the way down your shirt. Right, yes. Very good. <laughs> it's right. not usual. I'm usually got stuff all over. A little messier. Yes. <laughs> all right. Uh, Jody, you have one, two, three, four, five. What is this bug okay, beetle thing? So the first one is what is this insect? And Stag beetle. Good or bad? It's good. Okay, so your second one is, what is this? Okay, so Jonathan brought these last week as his sample. They are green June beetles. Good or bad? They're Who just knows? neutral. They're indifferent. flying around, they're indifferent. <laughs> All right, then we have a third one, which I think we might have had last okay. week. This is I, a different You did viewer. have this last week. Yeah. This is American carrion beetle, so uh, you might find these on uh, carcasses. Okay, eating the carcass. Yeah, the larvae eat the carcass, and the adults eat larvae of other things that eat carcass. All right, something has to clean it up. And what's this fourth one? Okay, so this is not related at all. This is not a beetle. This is a stone fly, so it's an aquatic insect. As an adult, it may look scary because they can be quite large, but they do not have any uh, mouth parts to feed. So. Well, that's not fair to them. Well, they mate and carry on. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then croak. They have other yeah. priorities. Yeah. Here you go. So, yeah. so all good things. All right. Thanks, Jody. All right, Matt, this is not such a good thing. This actually uh, came to us from uh, Kimball. So 20 miles from Wyoming, funny looking star shaped straw like grasses are showing up. What is it and should she be concerned? Um, yeah, I suppose you could be concerned. It's windmill grass and this time of year, lawns that have it, they have all these seed heads popping up and once they fall off the plant, they will kind of tumble around and spread more seed. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a perennial and it actually it spreads year after year, so it gets bigger and bigger. It's kind of a uh, warm season grass, I guess you would consider it. But it's it's pretty difficult to control. There's only one product that works. Uh, Tenacity is the only one, and it takes at least three applications to kill it. So it's about every two weeks you're applying that product. So it's it's not an easy one to get rid of. If you only have a couple of them, pull them out, and that's the best way to do it. All right, thanks. That's yeah, yeah. tough. All right, uh, Amy, this is Underwood, Iowa. Pictures of tomato plants. What is it and what to do about it? It's our beautiful early blight of tomato. Starts mm -hmm. on the bottom of the plant, keeps working its way up. Soil borne fungus, best management if you can put mulch down, avoid overhead irrigation. And the nice thing this time of year is your tomatoes are usually pretty lush. Prune them, mm -hmm. remove those, and the more foliage you move away from that soil line, the less likely you're going to get disease development. So that would be probably the best recommendation right now is prune them up, allow air circulation in there um, so the leaves dry much quicker. All right. Thanks, Amy. All right. And speaking of tomatoes, what's happening with these early girls, John? So that looks to me like we could have a, a bug issue. Mm -hmm. And I think it's actually tomato hornworm mm -hmm. feeding. So mm -hmm. you could see these big, juicy caterpillars that are out feeding on the tomatoes. Uh, and that is sort of what the damage looks like. I see some other little critters that I think have moved in mm -hmm. uh, after that, but it's that big, that big caterpillar that's feeding on there. Uh, so you can go out and hand pick them. Uh, you can uh, use uh, a BT type product, uh, or you can, um, you know, just just uh, move them if you find them. You know, mm -hmm. or or if you find the ones with the little wasps on the back, leave those because those will kill the other ones. All right, and I think you have one more that's maybe a specky looking thing. Yes, so I think that is actually a, a bacterial speck, bacterial spot on tomato. So it. Some, sometimes it's called fly speck, mm -hmm. uh, and that is a bacterial disease. So some of that is going to be uh, with, with good uh, cleanliness, uh, removing diseased parts of plants, uh, doing some, some mulch that'll splash around. Uh, so, you know, there's not a whole lot you can really do. I would just, you know, try to, to clean up. All right, thanks, John. Well, a few years ago, we showed you some fantastic new varieties of ornamental pearl millet being developed right here at the university. We thought we'd take a few minutes to show you how this project is going and what's coming up in the future. Here's University of Nebraska Associate Professor Keenan Amundsen to tell us more. If you look behind me and around the pearl millet nursery, you see corn. It's about six to eight feet tall right now, eight to 10 feet tall. Uh, grain millet gets to about eight to 12 feet tall. And so this is our ornamental pearl millet breeding program. And our, for ornamental purposes, we try to select for dwarf traits, uh, different colors, uh, head characteristics, canopy architecture, things like that. Uh, traits that might be desirable in a, in, a, in a landscape, in a nursery. Basically in our ornamental pearl millet breeding program, we're working with, it doesn't look like it, but we're working with two different colors, either this bright varescent green or a dark green background. And then we're also working with a couple of purple mutations that you can see in the foreground here. And we're trying to, to combine different purple mutations, either on the green background or the varescent background and that gives us different colors and you can see kind of the range of colors from some of these coppery colors to the bright green to the dark purples and so those are some of the very the variability in the color traits that we're after in addition to that we're looking at um, the fullness of the canopy uh, and then the head shapes you can see on some of these varieties 
they're a little earlier and so the heads are just starting to come out. Uh, and as they fully extrude, they have different lengths and shapes and, and other characters that we're interested in. Yeah, so pearl millet's a great plant for the landscape. Uh, it's, it does really well in arid parts of Africa and Asia. And because of that, it does great in drought type landscapes. In addition to that, uh, it produces the, it gets its name pearl millet. The seed looks like a small string of pearls and that's where it gets its name. And that, those, those seeds are really desirable for birds and, and other, other types of animals. Pearl millet, uh, it changes in color and characters throughout the growing season. It's an annual crop, so it will set seed and die in the fall and then we'll plant it again in the spring. But an alternative use for pearl millet, you can harvest some of those seed heads into the fall and they have great range in color and shape and you can use those almost in a, as a cut flower. There are really a lot of great combinations of color, texture, height. You ought to try one in your home landscape. We have them on campus, you know, at the front gates if you want to see them. They're just fabulous and the birds love them too. So get there before the birds do if you want to bring them in the house. All right, Jody, picture, we had three people send us this question. These critters are devouring the Baptisia. What are they and is the butterfly or moth worth not killing the caterpillar for? Um, unfortunately, it, well, it is the genista worm or genista moth or the genista broom moth. Um, no, they're actually not that pretty. And so you might have to do something about this caterpillar because in large numbers, it will completely defoliate your, your plants. Yeah. Um, they do, well, to me, they look yellow with these black raised spots and these white raised spots with them and then these white long hairs come out of them. Um, you may see some of the frass, you may see some of the webbing. They do pupate um, over winter, but the adults' moths will fly at night, so you probably won't see them, so they won't give you any benefit. So try to save your false indigos and maybe do a treatment of BT. BT would work, all right, and they really can annihilate overnight. All right, so you have three weed pictures, Matt, because you do weeds and Bill doesn't have a clue. Uh, so let's <laughs> so let's, <laughs> so let's start with the first one here. Looks like a carrot. What do you think that one is? Hemlock. And poisonous. Okay, get rid of it. <laughs> it. Yep. And the second one is. Uh, it looks like an amaranth species, Palmer amaranth or pigweed. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's a weed. Pull it out. Pull it out. And if they have too much of it. Yeah, most broadleaf herbicides work well on them. Okay, and the or third, mullet. yeah, and the third one is actually from Midtown Omaha, and, that, and it's already gone to seed. Yeah, and, and so yeah, pull it out without dropping all the seeds. Field pennycrest. It's a winter annual, so yeah, unless if there is already a bunch there, spray it this fall when everything is dormant, all and right. you'll be able to kill it. And I think the uh, the conversation on that one was, is this a something that's supposed to be here because it looks so pretty in no. seed? I know, It'll be worse so next year if you want to leave it. If you <laughs> like right. the seed, leave it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, this is an Omaha viewer who just happens to have pictures of peppers, Ooh. Amy, with spots. So, so, just a quick repetition of... Yep, so exactly what I showed at the beginning of the show. This is bacterial spot. Um, nothing you can do for it. Pinch off the leaves as best as possible and make sure next year you rotate away from peppers and tomatoes in that spot because it can overwinter. I wonder when, it, when the uh, seed purveyors will come out with tested for this particular virus. I have bacteria, I have no idea. Yeah. So I would guess it'd have to be the fruit that's really infected for those seeds to be. So they yeah. just need to make sure they harvest healthy right. looking peppers to collect the seed from. Okay, gotta keep that in mind. All right, John, this is a Phillipsburg, Kansas viewer watches our show all the time, which we love, and has sent a picture of a golden spirit smoke tree. Uh, it's been three years in the yard. It is full suns. It's never produced the smoke, and now it's got these crispy looking leaves and things. It is full sun. They've had hot winds. She's hoping it's just heat stress and not something else. So what do you think about golden spirit in Phillipsburg, Kansas? 
So I think the crispy parts are just the, the heat and the wind. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, you know, looking at it though, there's some, so the leaves are supposed to be golden yellow mm -hmm. and they look a little more whitish yellow to me. Mm -hmm. So there could also be uh, some sort of, you know, misplacement at like it's not happy. Maybe it needs to be in the smoking section. It's a smoke tree, <laughs> right? Maybe it's not in the right place. Uh, or it could be uh, nutritional, like maybe it needs a little nitrogen or iron, so do a soil test to see what it might be missing. Mm -hmm. But it's not anthracnose or I don't think so. It doesn't, doesn't. it doesn't look like a disease. It looks more environmental and, right. and nutritional, yeah. maybe. I've seen Golden Spirit in Lincoln, and it is really gold, but it's not white gold. So yeah. you're, you're right on that one. All right, we always have fun announcements of interesting things in the gardening world. And we have, first off, the Lincoln Iris Society annual rhizome sale and auction this Saturday, the 21st, St. Andrew's Lutheran Church here in Lincoln. Uh, our second one is the Greater Omaha Iris Society Iris rhizome sale, Friday the 27th, also a St. Andrew's, that one's in Omaha. So make sure that uh, you go to the right St. Andrews if you want to go to Lincoln or <laughs> Omaha. And then uh, our third one is we have, of course, our Grow a Row produce donations, which is five to seven on Tuesdays in our backyard farmer garden. We'd love to have you bring that extra produce because that produce goes to From the Heart. This week we had 360 pounds from the backyard farmer garden. Grow a Row brought us 65. That's a lot of produce to be able to give to people that, that really uh, need to eat it. Mm -hmm. No sense in letting it go to waste. All right, so we have time for just some regular old questions because I said hurry and you did, which means I'm gonna have to come up with questions. <laughs> All right, so Jody, um, we have some people who are, have been battling Japanese beetles on their grapevines and spotted winged Drosophila on some fruit. But then she found this other beetle-like thing that is brown with two black spots. What's that? Did she find it on the grapevine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds like the grapevine beetle. <laughs> you guys always have such great names yeah, for it. Right. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and it is, it really, I haven't heard of any problems with it. It's just, you just pick them off because they are quite large. Yeah, grapevine. Grapevine beetle. Beetle. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> Sorry. So this is Wahoo, uh, and this is crabgrass in strawberries. Matt, how do you control crabgrass in a strawberry bed? Well, this time of year, there's no fruit on it, so you could probably go in with some selective grass herbicides, like mm -hmm. Floazifop, I think is one of them, mm -hmm. that will control the grass, but not the broad leaves. So there's a couple other products out there that are like Grass Be Gone, um, I would assume that those would be okay now mm -hmm. and since the fruit won't be till next year. Okay, and so if they have one of those strawberries that is supposedly okay. ever bearing. You probably don't right. want to spray it with the herbicide then. You probably <laughs> want to pull the grass out instead. All right, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Amy, uh, uh -huh. so this is, um, this is a Douglas fir question. Mm -hmm. Obviously in trouble, 15 to 20 feet tall, kind of losing the top. Does that sound an awful lot like? Most likely it sounds like a canker mm -hmm. of some sort. There isn't a lot you can do for that age of a tree. Mm -hmm. um, continue watering it. Think about driving around your neighborhood for the trees that you like so you can pick out what tree you would like to replace it with this fall mm -hmm. and plant it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right, John, I'm going to throw two at you rather quickly because oh, no. both of these are kind of interesting. We've got less than a minute. Um, the question is, isn't Liatris invasive? It's not. So the, there, there are, I think, some things that sound similar that might be invasive. Lithrum. Yeah, Lithrum. Which but, is also purple. Yes, which is also purple, but Liatris, no. Okay, so Wilbur, Nebraska, in 10 seconds or less. Apricots, uh, the fruit is white, not orange. What's up with that? It could be a, a cultivar issue. I mean, it, it would be hard to say without seeing. Or taste. Or, or tasting. tasting. Right, or yes. Tasting. <laughs> tasting is actually better, especially if you like apricots fresh mm -hmm. off the tree. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much.